Well, uh, good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to our service today, especially if we have any visitors with us. I trust you'll enjoy your time with us. Our end of the month service um, takes place e 8 o'clock this evening and we encourage you all to come along and join with us once again. So that's in the, the church hall. Uh, Midweek on Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. in the minor hall. And as always, we extend a very warm welcome to all our congregation to come along and join with us as we study and pray together. We are in chapter 2 of our study on uh, the fear of the Lord with the help of, of Michael Reeves' book. So that's 8 p.m. Wednesday. Then... Uh, just to remind you that the 11.30 prayer meeting is uh, before the Sabbath morning, and that uh, continues next week. And uh, I, just at this point, I'll tell you that uh, there's a pulpit swap next week, and um, we will have the Reverend uh, Paul Wright from Cookstown, and John will be taking the service in the Cookstown um, meeting house. Uh, there's a Northern Presbytery CY sleepover that will take place on Friday the 28th of October. Um, that's in Collybacky. And uh, there's a poster with details in the vestibule for those that are uh, of that age group. Then uh, tomorrow evening is the registration for the... Uh, new session of the um, Boys and Brigade and, and the Girls' Guide, so uh, that's also there in your bulletin. Uh, the plate is in the vestibule for the, your gifts for the Pakistan Disaster uh, Fund, and uh, there's a special appeal there for that. So with that, I would like to uh, mention also as I have on, on, with our previous minister, that today is uh, John's birthday, and you have to make a special effort on the way out to wish him a very happy birthday. He hasn't even got halfway to the first bus pass, never mind the, 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 uh, the blue one. So uh, I'll start the ball rolling there and wish you a happy birthday, John. Well, good morning. Let's come and worship God. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 135, verse 5, where the psalmist says at the beginning of the psalm, Praise the Lord, for I know that the Lord is great, and that, all the, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth and makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouse. And so we see here in the psalm that God's hand is in the whole of creation. We're going to be thinking today about God's providence. That is his plan for the, his world, all created things. And part of that is that he sustains the world. He upholds it. He causes the rain to come. He causes the wind to come too. And so we praise our God. Well, let's sing from Psalm 147a. Psalm 147a. And we're singing stanzas 8 uh, through to 13. 8 through to 13 of Psalm 147a. And we're singing it to tune to 131. Here the psalmist says in stanza 8, Extol the Lord Jerusalem, your God, O Zion, praise. 
For your gate spars, he strengthens. Your sons within does bless. He gives peace to the borders. Santa Ten, he spreads the frost like ashes, sends snow like wool on land. He hurls his heel like pebbles, who can his cold withstand. Stands eleven, but when the seed, when he sends forth his word forth, it melts the heel like snow. The wind the bl- uh, to blow, he causes the water start to flow. And so we see here God's sustaining hand across the world. And then how he brings his word and he establishes his word in the world. At the end, in stanzas 12 and 13. Let's stand and sing Psalm 147a, singing stanzas 8 to 13. Let's praise God. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we worship you for you are the one who upholds the whole of this universe. Lord God, we praise you that you're the one who sends the snow upon the earth, that you're the one who causes the clouds to rise at the end of the earth and send forth rain with the lightning. Lord God, you are the one who ordains the wind to blow. Its strength, its direction, and its length that it blows to. Lord God, we praise you that you're the one who causes the seed to uh, sprout in the ground. That as our farmers in these past weeks have been uh, reseeding their fields, Lord, you're the one that causes that seed to germinate in the ground and to sprout forth and to break forth in shoot above the ground too. Lord God, you're the one that gives life to the cattle and to the beast. Lord, you're even the one that keeps our hearts beating, uh, the blood pumping round our veins and arteries, and brings and gives us breath that we can take into our bodies uh, to provide oxygen for them. Lord God, you do this and many more things to uphold your universe. And so we praise you, Lord, because we owe it all to you. We owe our very existence. Lord, we owe the sustenance that we have to you. And so we adore you this day. Lord God, we come also at the outset of our service and we confess our sins. 
For Lord, we know that at times in this past week we have doubted your love. Lord, other times we have lacked faith in your promises. Lord, at times we have questioned your plans for our lives. Lord, on other occasions we've rebelled against your ways, against the plans that you have, and we've wanted to go our own way. Lord, we have been filled with selfishness at times. Lord, we often have so much pride in our heart and self-worth. Lord, pardon all our iniquities and transgressions. May you stamp them underfoot and no longer hold them to our account because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Be with us now, Lord, we pray. Bless us in our time of worship as we bless you. In Christ's name, amen. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37, please. We're going to recommend or resume our series in the life of Joseph. And today we're going to take a bit of an overview of what we've seen so far and look at the theme or the, uh, the truth of God's providence, God's plan in Joseph's life. And so, boys and girls, as we read this chapter, chapter 37, you have to get your fingers out again today because I want you to listen out for how many times God's name is mentioned in this chapter. And parents, you can encourage them in their answer that they have at the end of it. Okay, you'll understand that by the end of the chapter again. Okay, so Genesis chapter 37, we read from verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak kindly a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, They hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were building sheaves of corn out in the field when suddenly my sheave rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun, the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told it to his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flock near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent them, him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I am looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. 
But they saw him in the distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes, what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Do not shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and they threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out, up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornament and robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning I will go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph to Egypt, in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officer, officials, the captain of the guard. Amen. Boys and girls, do you want to come to the front? Well, boys and girls, I have something beside me here, and maybe your parents were wondering as they came in, what is a fan doing at the front of the church? Now, we're going to look at a, we're going to be thinking today in the sermon about a really, quite a strange topic, a topic that we sort of find hard to get our heads around again this week. And so I've brought this fan to illustrate it, right? So we're going to have to turn it away from us. And if I press this button, now, can you see the air moving? No, you're shaking your heads thinking that I am really strange. Now, let's see, if I hold this in front of it, can you see the air moving now? Yes. We see how the air is pushing the the thread to uh, blow in the same direction. Same way that if I'd turned it in front of Hannah's hair, her hair would have went behind her and flapped away, so it would have. Well, boys and girls, we're going to be thinking about today God's providence. And that means God has planned everything. Everything that's going to happen, God has planned it all. But sometimes 
we can't see God's plan. It's a bit like the the breeze and the air that we can't see moving. But boys and girls, when we read it through scripture, we learn that God's providence is there. God has a plan. We see in scripture, we're going to see it with Joseph, that God had a plan for Joseph. But at some times, it is invisible. We can't always see it, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. The same way when the fan's running by itself, and we, can't, we don't have the thread in front of it, there's still air going, the air's still moving, although we can't see it. But every time that we put the, the thread in front of it, we see that the, the air is moving. The fan is working and it's blowing the air and moving the air over there. Well, that's the same with God's providence, boys and girls. We can't always see it, but it's always is there. And so God's providence is God's plan. God's planned everything out, boys and girls. God's planned which family you're a part of. How many brothers and sisters you would have. What school you would go to. We're going to even see in the sermon, boys and girls, God even planned down to the very details how many hairs there's on our head. Even what clothes we were wearing today. God has planned out all things. And boys and girls, that's a, that's a wonderful truth for us. It's a truth of great encouragement. So God's plan, we can't always see it. But scripture tells us that God has a plan for everything. Here's your sheet for today. And you can... Go back to your seats, okay? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, Naomi. There's two. Okay. You're welcome. Let's continue to worship God as we give to him our offering. In a moment, we're going to sing. And then after that, we're going to be praying for different things. And so I just wanted to mention a little bit about what we're going to be praying about. We're going to be praying for those in work in the congregation. And then we're going to be praying for a matter in the world. Years ago, you may remember that there was a work, an RP work in Syria. And then um, when the various Syrian wars uh, arose, the RP missions had to move out of there. And they moved into Ethiopia. And they were working in the Tigra, I think is how it's pronounced, uh, province. And the RP missions has continued to have a presence there. And there's been an RP work there. And as you'll have maybe have realized in the news that there's been a civil war happening in Ethiopia between the Tigra uh, province and the rest of Ethiopia, I think is the simplest way to summarize it. Uh, but we want to pray for the work there. There's been little communication uh, with the work there since... Um, middle of the summer, I believe, and there are God's people there who are suffering and struggling, and there's a, a nation that's being torn apart by war, and so we want to pray for peace. And so we'll come and we'll pray for those things in a moment. Let's sing first. We're singing from Psalm 104. Psalm 104. 
and 4. And we're singing stanzas 13 through to 16. We're singing the tune 66. Here in Psalm 104 and in Psalms 13 to 16, this is a psalm all about creation. And here we see God's hand of providence as he makes the grass grow for the cattle in the, in the fields. He causes the grain to uh, sprout forth. He provides the food which man eats and enjoys. Those um, uh, things that we uh, uh, put on our faces as well, you know. Uh, the oil in the Old Testament which was used. God provides all those things. He provides the bread, stanza 14, which gives strength to us. And so we see how God is the one who's sustaining him and upholding his world. And as Paul tells us elsewhere, it's Christ Jesus who does this work. So we sing Psalm 104, stanzas 13 to 16. Let's praise God. Let's pray. Lord God, we've been singing once again about how you have ordained all things, how you sustain life too. And Lord, we recognize that that is such a comforting truth for us. Lord, when we see our world uh, wreaked uh, with war, as we see nation a nation tearing itself apart as people of... Um, different clans of uh, different states within a nation are um, at war with one another and uh, killing each other and fighting and protesting. Lord God, we do pray for uh, there to be a ceasefire within uh, the, the civil war in Ethiopia. Lord, we pray that there are uh, those who are seeking to be involved in brokering peace, that they would be successful, Lord. That there would no longer be, Lord, uh, bloodshed, that there would no longer be death, Lord, that the damage and the destruction caused, Lord, to lives and to communi communities and to the land, Lord, that that would also stop. Lord, we pray that those uh, charities that are seeking to bring uh, humanitarian aid, that they would be permitted to go into the areas that need it, and that they would know safety, Lord, as they seek to uh, bring, uh, do that very practical and necessary work. Lord, we think also of your people that are there. Not only the, uh, those who are RPs, Lord, but also those, Lord, of uh, different denominations, Lord, who uh, believe in Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, we pray that you would watch over them. Lord, we pray that you would protect them. We pray that you would give wisdom to their, uh, their sessions and their leadership, Lord, as to how to meet the mercy ministries around them, of how to bring the hope of the gospel, Lord, to a land torn by war. Lord, we pray that you would miraculously work and bring peace and reconciliation. And Lord God, we pray that the peace 
that comes through the gospel would spread forth throughout that land and that there would, Lord, be um, different, the, these different groups would be able to live one with another peaceably. Lord, we think of our own congregation here at home and we pray for those who are in the workplace. Lord, we pray for those in the various uh, vocations of life that they're involved in or those in very manual work and those, Lord, who have to, uh, are more involved in sitting at a desk, Lord, and thinking and strategizing and planning and, Lord, doing uh, a very different but all just as important a work. Lord, we pray that you would be with each person. Lord, we pray that you would sustain them, Lord, each day. We pray that they would know as uh, you gave to Joseph that presence of you and that through your presence being with them, Lord, that they would know success in their work, that they would know blessing from you upon them as they do their work and upon their bosses and the places of employment that they serve. Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom in the decisions that they have to make. We pray that you would give to them the skill set needed. We pray that you would guide them as to um, the difficult uh, challenges that they have to work through and the planning that's involved at times too. Lord, we pray for those who are going through particularly unsettling times in the workplace, whether it's, Lord, by pressures put upon them unnecessarily or whether, Lord, it is by just the challenges of what's unfolded in accordance with your will. Lord, give them strength. Give them perseverance. Lord, may they seek to do it all to the glory of your name. And Lord, we pray that you bless them as witnesses in their workplaces. That, Lord, they would be able to speak words in season. That they'd be able to live before their fellow colleagues. That those who come on and off the farmyard, Lord, that they would be able to live a life of Christ before them. And that, Lord, you would bless them because of that. Lord, as we turn our mind to your word now, we need the Spirit's help. And Lord, we need understanding that comes from him. So teach us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Today we resume our study of Joseph. We paused our series after considering Genesis 39 and we left him in the prison that Potiphar had thrown him into. You will remember that though Joseph triumphed over the temptation uh, that came before him by Potiphar's wife, victory was bittersweet. The chapter concluded with him being unfairly thrown into prison because Potiphar's wife had made false accusations against him. So Joseph fell from the heights that he had been promoted to into an Egyptian prison where it seems he was forgotten about. It's been a while since we've been here in Genesis, so our study this morning will hopefully jog the memory. Those of you who maybe missed the study as you're away on holidays, it will hopefully help to fill in the blanks. And our focus today is we want to survey chapters 37 to 39 and observe God's providence, God's plan in the life of Joseph. We're going to see that God has planned everything and his plans will come to pass. God's hand is in the events of life. He's actively involved. It's not like the watchmaker where he winds up the clock and walks away. God is working even today. So we're to study, the title of our study this morning is The Hand of God in the Life of Joseph So Far. And there's three things that we want to learn about God's providence. It's invisible. It includes the detail and also even the difficult. And so let's firstly consider the hand of God is invisible boys and girls that's your word invisible it means it can't be seen it's like the fan down here where we couldn't see the air moving until we put the string in front of it 
I realize, boys and girls, I forgot to ask you the question of how many times does God's name come up in the passage? It's a big, fat zero. And so if you counted no times, you got full, full marks there. Here in Genesis chapter 37, there's not a single mention of God. In the midst of all that's happening here in this chapter, his name is never mentioned. Nor do we ever see God sp- or hear of God speaking in this passage. There's no audible voice, nor is there a message received that a prophet is directed to proclaim. Nor do we read of God doing anything in this chapter, whether it's miraculous or ordinary. It appears to all intents and purposes that he's not present here, that he's not active, that he's not involved. Chapter 37 stands in contrast to chapters 38 and 39. Even in the godless, rebellious acts of Judah in chapter 38, we find the special name of God reserved for his people used three times. Verse 7, But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then again in verse 10, regarding Judah's second son, Onan, and he did what was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he, also, he put him also to death. Very clearly we see the Lord's hand in this 38th chapter. He's acting in justice as he strikes down two wicked men, putting them to death in the prime of life. Now let's look at chapter 39. The hand is unmissable here. As a slave in Potiphar's house, we read in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. And later in the prison cell, the author repeats it in verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. When we studied this chapter, we noted the effects of the Lord's presence. Joseph was successful He found favor and he was promoted. God's blessing is poured out upon Potiphar's house because of God's presence with Joseph. We see that God was acting in such visible ways that in verse 3, Potiphar, a pagan who doesn't believe in the living and true God, discerns God's hand. His master saw that the Lord was with him. The presence of God's hand is unmistakable in this chapter. However, when we return again to chapter 37, it seems to be quite the opposite. No name is mentioned, no actions done, nor statements made by God. What are we to make of this? Are we therefore to conclude that the hand of God was not involved? Are we to to determine that these events were left up to fate and chance? That the, the boys were just doing what boys do and they were doing their own thing, that there was no control in it? Not at all. Psalm 105, which we'll sing at the end, testifies to God decreeing the events that happen in chapter 37. Psalm 105 verse 16 says, When God summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. As we survey these chapters collectively, we learn that God's hand is at times invisible. God's providence isn't always dramatic and eye-catching. It's often mundane, obscure, and far from the limelight. Although there is no word from the Lord or mighty deed, God's hand is present and working here, even in the events which lead to Joseph being sold. God's will is being unfolded as Joseph pastures the flock with his brothers. As he was promoted and to that position of authority, By his father. 
God's hand was acting as his brothers hated and were jealous of him. So much so that they sell him as a slave to Egypt. It was God's plan and it was executed just as he willed it. Although God is not mentioned, his providence, his plan is central to this chapter. It's thought that over four billion people watched the state funeral on Monday. And in true British fashion, it was executed with military precision. But the plans were years in the making. One ranking official said that the document was over a hundred pages long. And after watching it, we can understand why. 2,000 dignitaries in attendance. Over 1,500 soldiers marched in procession to Wellington Arch. 10,000 police officers, including spotters and snipers, were on the ground. And 6,000 military personnel were on standby. There was a lot of behind-the-scenes work. But apart from the media's reporting on it and the footage of the nighttime rehearsals, it would have been invisible to us. We wouldn't have known that anything had been going on. God's providence today is often invisible. Usually there's no big display or vocal declaration. This, however, does not mean that God is inactive. His hand is at work as he preserves the world. Hebrews 1.3, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. It's referring to Jesus there that he literally bears it up. He's carrying the load on his shoulders and if he ceased to hold it, the world would stop to existing. His hand is, is at work as he directs every aspect of creation. We sang of that in those two first opening psalms. The world follows its rotation because Jesus continues daily to direct it to spin at the speed, to tilt at the angle that it should do so. He's the one who causes the seasons to change. As you have been reseeding your fields in this past week, he's the one who will cause the seed to germinate in the soil. You can put it in the ground. You can walk away. You can put the fertilizer on it in the spring, the slurry before the 31st of October. But unless God causes it to grow, it won't. He's the one who directs everything. God's hand is at work as he advances his purposes. He brings them to his desired end. As Ephesians 1 tells us, God accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. Unbeliever, God's word says, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Whether you believe that God exists or not, regardless of whether you give him the allegiance or not, this fact is true. Your life rests in his hand. That breath which fills your lung the heart which beats in your chest, the blood which circulates your body only happens because God wants it to. And he can choose at any moment to stop it. Elsewhere, scripture tells us one day he will call it back from us and immediately we will die. Are you ready? If that day were to come today, where would you spend eternity? Would it be with him because you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin? Or is it away from him, suffering 
his judgment forever. The hand of God is invisible. Okay, boys and girls, your next word is detail. The hand of God is in the detail. We've considered in our first point the truth of God's providence, that we see that that principle is established in Scripture, that he's ordained all the events of life and he's actively involved in them coming to pass. Now we want to see his hand, is, his plan is not a vague, rough sketch. He hasn't put a few notes on a piece of paper saying that's what it might look like. No, what we're going to see in this point illustrated in Joseph's life is that God's hand is in the details, even the insignificant ones. Remember in chapter 37, verse 12, Joseph's father comes and asks him quite a normal request. He says, go and check up on your brothers. See how they're doing. And so Joseph goes to check him where he supposed that they should be, but he can't find them. And so Joseph is aimlessly wandering through the fields, scratching his head. You can imagine it, wondering where on earth they're at. How on earth is he going to find them? And this stranger comes along. And he knows who Joseph is. He knows who his brothers are. And he says, I can tell you. Moreover, he knew that they had moved on to Dothan. This was not chance. It was God's plan. And likewise, it was not luck which meant that his brothers were still in Dothan when Joseph arrived. It was the will of God that his brothers would spot him in the distance, would be able to recognize his walk and his coat, and that they would then begin to conspire. And the idea that we're given here is that they, they had a plan set in place before he got near them. It was in the will of God that their evil intent was curved by Reuben's revised plan. Remember, Reuben says, hold on a second, let's not kill him. Let's throw him in this pit instead because Reuben wants to save him and bring him back to his father. God ordained that the brothers would sit down and eat and that they would be able to lift their eyes at the right moment, that they'd be sitting looking in the right direction to be able to see the caravan of Midianites traveling towards Egypt. And that at that sight, it would strike a thought in Judah's head. We could make some money from Joseph. We could sell him. God's hand meant that Reuben's plan to save Joseph and bring him back to his father was uh, frustrated and thwarted because he was away. And he wasn't back to restrain his brothers from selling them, from selling Joseph. All these seemingly insignificant details were part of God's plan. God's plan entailed more than just getting Joseph to Egypt. It comprised of every detail which fulfilled that goal. God had ordained it all before it ever took place. Young people, for some of you, this will be fresh in your mind because you've come from Maz class this week. Maybe for us adults, it's not so fresh. But in Maz, your teacher will maybe will ask you to write an answer to a sum to two decimal places. That means you'll look at the third number after the decimal place and you'll see whether it's lower or higher and whether you have to round the second number up or down. Those of you in primary school are maybe asked to round the closest ten, hundred, or thousand. But when you round your answer, it's not precise. If you were to round up your, your bills, you'd be a few pounds, maybe a few hundred pounds, out men in your farming. But here God's providence is to the nth degree. It's to the last decimal place. God's providence 
includes the detail. That's true of your life and my life also. God hasn't just picked the date of your birth and then the date of your death and sure, whatever happens in between, we'll see what happens. No, he hasn't left anything blank. He's planned everything in between. He's filled out the details and his will is taking place. He's not not only planned the big events of life, your school, work, marriage or singleness, how long you'd be in that job for before you'd move to another job, the year that you'd, uh, you'd retire. No, everything along the way has been planned. If it had not, he wouldn't be sovereign over all things. If God hadn't ordained it, he wouldn't be in control over things. There'd be other powers at work. God's hand is in the insignificant details of your life. The moment that you wake up, the order you get ready, the food you eat, the journey time to work. And so we are not hapless victims of of fate or those who are given over to chance or luck. Everything which happens takes place in the will of God. And that's why it's such a serious event when we say, well, I was lucky. That was fortunate. It just so happened by chance. Third time's the charm. Touch wood, it'll be okay. Fingers crossed. Or other statements like that. Such statements deny God his rightful place. And we as Christians should seek always to give him his due. It's deplorable that the unbeliever should deny God's work, God's plan, God's providence, God's rule over all things. How much more we as Christians who profess to believe in this God and in this truth. We believe in a God who has ordained everything from beginning to end. We believe in the providence of God. We believe the hand of God is in the detail. It's lastly Think about this morning, the hand of God in the difficult boys and girls. The difficult, that means in the hard times of life. God is over it. He has planned it. One of the hardest elements of God's providence is having to wrap our heads around dark providences. Dark providences are those challenging, painful devastating events which occur in our lives. Whether it be a sudden illness, death, car accident, job loss, or simply the difficult grinds of life. Joseph teaches us God has not just permitted them to happen. He's not just let the difficult, the dangerous and the distressing happen. He's ordained them to happen. And he has a purpose in them happening. In Genesis 37, it appears that home life was very unhappy for Joseph. We observed before in verse 4 that he was selected as leader by his father. And this led immediately to his brothers to hate him. To the point where they couldn't speak peacefully with him. We saw that that meant that they couldn't even greet him the time of day. Such was their hatred that they decided to profit at his expense by first planning to kill him to get rid of the dreams and then they decide just to sell him so that they'll have money in their pockets. In chapter 38, dark providences are in Judah's life as He departs from everything godly and pursues a life of sin. He experiences God's judgment as his two sons are struck down because of their great wickedness. 
He knows the death probably of his wife earlier in life than what was normal. And then he gets tangled up in all sorts of sin as he's away with this, uh, this Adullamite named Hira to the point where he gives himself to a prostitute and it turns out that he's sleeping with his own daughter-in-law. God's hand was in the dark providences of Judah's life. And then in chapter 39, Joseph arrives as a slave in Potiphar's house. He's unable to speak the language. He's unfamiliar with their customs. Even the good providences are soured somewhat by the constant harassment by Potiphar's wife. As he makes progress, as he advances in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife nags at him, tempts at him, lures herself before him, wanting him to come into her. And it climaxes with her trying to sexually assault him, except he gets away. But despite doing the right thing, lies are told of Joseph, and he finds himself in the pit again. He went from being in charge to being charged with crimes. He went from enjoying life to suffering in a prison. Often the challenges, or sorry, often the challenge with God's providence is the mystery which surrounds it. That mystery of why is this happening? What's the purpose in this? Why am I going through this? Why again do I feel like this? In those moments when we're passing through dark providences, we don't see God's purpose in it. In hindsight, sometimes, yes, we can understand, just like Joseph did years later of why God had brought him on that journey, made him a slave, brought him into Potiphar's house. He saw that it was so that he would save his brothers from starvation. But in the moment, as he sat in that prison cell as he walked behind those camels on the way to Egypt. God's providence was a mystery to him. It was a mystery as to the purpose that God had. And Joseph had to be content with not knowing it. And that's the same in our lives. As we look at ourselves and we wonder, why am I going again to the consultant? Why am I needing another blood test? Why is there that another setback in work? We've got to be content sometimes with knowing, not with not knowing why these things happen. The purpose in dark providences is to strengthen and to develop us. God wants to strengthen our faith. And so each time that Joseph found himself in the pit again, there was evidently more that God wanted him to learn there. Joseph wasn't in the pit without a purpose. And though also in, in Potiphar's house, we learn, Joseph learned skills that he'd be able to put to use as prime minister. And if he remained in Potiphar's house, he may never have pr- progressed any further. Certainly not with the character which he learned and developed in prison. We can think about how Joseph must have learned patience in prison. As he went up and down and up and down and here he was once again in the pit, forgotten about. How he must have learned humility there and how he must have been tested to trust in God during those dark providences. Paul's word to the Romans should be, and I hope it is, a comfort and a challenge to us as we face these dark providences. It's a verse that we know well And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. These words challenge our faith as we walk through dark providences. The challenge comes of, do we believe that this will work out for our eternal good? This verse It also be a comfort to us because we believe that whatever the dark providence is, 
ultimately, in the end, it's for our good. And so it challenges us to persist, uh, to, per, uh, to continue on, to persist through the dark province, knowing that it will be for our good. And it can be comfort to us because we can know that this is for our ultimate good. Without such verses, we would be a nervous wreck. We would be anxious. We would hope that we'd be hopeless. We would fret every day. The hand of God in the difficult. And so this morning, as we have gotten a refresh as to where we've gotten to so far in Joseph's life, as we leave him here now again, once again in the prison, we'll pick it up this evening in our next study. We've seen today that God's providence is his plan. And his hand is in, is, is invisible. His hand is in the detail. And his hand is in the difficult. Amen. We sing from Psalm 105. Psalm 105. And we sing to tune 106. Psalm 105, and we're singing stanzas 12 through to 14. Stanzas 12 through to 14. And here we see how Joseph paves the way. But we see, as we thought about earlier, that it was God who sent a man before them, stanza 12, the place where they would be fret fed. God had brought Joseph. He had ordained all the events that would bring him to Egypt to finally be the prime minister who would organize this great um, collection of grain that would be feeding Egypt and the world. God planned it all. He planned that he would be sold, that he'd be made a slave, that he'd be in the shekels. Uh, that's where we've left him now, at the end of chapter 39, in prison. But it wouldn't be there, and he wouldn't be there forever because God's plan would continue in stanza 14. He would then lift him out of there and he would bring him and the king would take him and release him in stanza 15. We sing now stanzas 12 to 14 of Psalm 105. Let's praise God. Let's pray. Lord God, we do take much comfort in knowing that you are the God who has planned all things out from start to finish. And that plan, Lord, includes the detail of everything that happens. And so, Lord, we aren't to be anxious. We aren't to be those nervous wrecks. We are not to fret because, Lord, we know that your plan is set and it will come to pass. Lord, we thank you that you're even in uh, control and that you've even planned out those dark providences. 
And Lord, we see and we've sung of just in this psalm of the purpose in which you send those dark providences to test us through and through. And so, Lord, for those who are going through those times at this time, Lord, we ask that you would, Lord, strengthen their faith. That, Lord, you would deepen their resolve in you. That they would trust and that they would not fear. And, Lord, would you prepare us for those days, Lord, when we do walk through those times too. Lord, help us always to look to you. Now, people of God, lift up your heads and receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift